Um, this section is the sort of share moments section. And if, if you see on LinkedIn, you'll see a hashtag of share moments. It won't just be this event. It will be lots of social mobility day related events. So I really encourage you to have a look at that. You'll see some fantastic kind of inspirational, uh, both sort of role model examples, case studies, things that are going on about this particular topic. Um, but our moderator is another HSBC person who, again, kindly strong armed a few people to allow us to have have this uh, this wonderful location that is Jazz. She's um, uh, the head of family office solutions here at HSB Asset Management. And I guess what that really means is it's a distribution type role. And as, as we've heard, um, there is a carrot and a stick actually when it comes to social mobility. The carrot is the kind of do it for the right reasons. The stick is there's a commercial reason to do it too. So it'd be great uh, at, the, at some stage to hear Jazz's views on that. But we also have Lisa, Harleen and Raheem who are going to tell us a bit more about their experiences. And with that, I think the sound's fixed and I'll disappear. Thank you, David. Um, thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. Um, as Stuart mentioned, we at HSBC take D, E and I very seriously. We have Joanna in the room as well. So it stems from the top of our organization all the way down. Um, and I'm co-leading the social mobility work stream, which, as Stuart's already mentioned, uh, the key tenants are work experience and degree apprentices. Uh, one thing I'd like to highlight, a, a lot of places do degree apprentices, and we've made the active decision to ensure that our degree apprentices are all in frontline roles, and we provide the social support, the social capital, the mentorship that's involved. Um, and today we're going to be hearing some very inspiring stories um, by Harleen, who's obviously a member of our HSBC group, but also Lisa and Raheem um, that are members of partner firms. And I'm sure you'll uh, all be very keen to hear their stories. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Lisa in the first instance. Sure. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending today to discuss such an important topic that is particularly close to me and allowing me to share my story with you all. So my grandparents were born in Ireland. Each were one of about eight to 12 siblings. And most of those migrated as there were no jobs or prospects for them in Ireland. My four grandparents came over to London at the age of 16, but had a difficult life here. They struggled to get jobs as the Irish were discriminated against with signs up everywhere saying no dogs, no blacks, no Irish. So they had to live in shared houses, sharing rooms with other Irish families um, in the same situation. They lived like this until they had children of their own and then had to rely on the council to house them. My nan, my only living grandparent today, still lives in the same council estate. They constantly had to worry about the most basic necessities, about whether there was food on the table or how they would afford school clothes for their children. I will luckily never truly understand their struggle. My parents were able to have an easier life. My father, um, a plumber, and my mum, who worked multiple jobs at the same times when I was younger, as a cleaner, a waitress, and a babysitter, they managed to save up and buy a small flat. This flat was in Halsden, an area known for being deprived and for its high crime rates. It was the only place they could afford, and they still live there today. But this was a huge achievement for them. Whilst it left little money for much else, they were so proud to be able to bring me and my sister up in a place of their own. But this didn't mean that I didn't have a good childhood. Although we didn't have loads of money to spare or live in the nicest or safest areas, it wasn't something I was ever really aware of. Everyone I was surrounded with was in the same situation as me and many in worse situations. This was just normal life to us. It wasn't until I was a little bit older when I really started to understand how my background could lead to a big gap in opportunities compared to those more fortunate than me. At school, I always enjoyed maths. I enjoyed the problem solving aspect of it. I loved numbers and I found I always naturally took to it. So I decided I wanted a career that involved numbers and also one that made me lots of money to allow my family to have the fortune that we never had growing up. So from about 11 years old, I decided that I wanted to be a big banker in the city, although I had no idea what that meant. I didn't know anyone that worked in the city in financial services or any white collar job um, to help me understand it any better. No one in my family had even gone to university. So I managed to excel in my GCSEs and then went on to choose A-levels, including maths and economics. However, as I looked a little closer as to what was required to get hired for these city roles, it became clear to me that I was never going to fit the profile of the typical candidate that they hired. 
I didn't have the extracurricular activities they had a preference for, such as playing a musical instrument or being fluent in another language. These required expensive tuition and out of school lessons from a young age that we just wasn't able to afford. I wasn't taking more than the standard three A levels, which would have required, expect, again, expensive tutoring or even private schooling. And I also likely wouldn't meet the requirement to have some form of relevant work experience or an internship within the industry. Getting that opportunity meant I either had to have met the last two criteria or known someone in the industry who could secure me one. Plus, these roles were normally given to candidates from the top universities, which for the same reasons, I was unlikely to get a place. So at this point, I had accepted that being a big banker in the city was no longer on the cards. How could it ever be for someone like me? However, a few months later, we had a speaker come into my sixth form from the brokerage, a social mobility charity working with young people from inner London state schools and disadvantaged backgrounds. He started to talk about apprenticeships. I'd, never, I'd only ever really associated apprenticeships with trades such as plumbing or nursing, so didn't think that this applied to me or the route that I wished to go down. But when the presenter was describing one of the opportunities, the vocational training scheme at Newton, my peers, of most of which um, was in school with me since year seven, turned around to say, please, isn't this what you say you've been wanting to do since forever? So with some renewed hope, I signed up to the brokerage. They invited me to their offices to help me write my application and my CV and sign up for the Newton role. And when I was offered the interview, I was invited back with them to help me re rehearse my interview skills. So after a successful assessment day and a few follow-up interviews, I was offered the role at Newton, conditional of me achieving my predicted A-levels, which I wouldn't sit until a few months later. The role was a degree apprenticeship where I would study three to four days a month towards my degree whilst working as part of the portfolio management support team, assisting a team of PMs. Everything seemed to finally be working out. But over the next few months, as I should have been preparing for my exams, I went through some personal hardship, which meant that my attendance from sixth form almost dropped off completely. So when the time came, with the lack of learning and revision, my A-levels proved to be too difficult and results they confirmed that I didn't achieve my expected grades. I was so disappointed, but what hit me the most was that I knew their role at Newton was likely gone. I eventually plucked up the courage to present to my 2B line manager with the situation. I assured him if he gave me a chance, despite not making my grades, I would really try and prove myself. To my surprise, he rang me up straight away. He'd been in contact with the head of the scheme and asked if there was any way they could still take me on, even if I wasn't able to sign up to the university course because of my grades. And there was. I was still able to take my place and do the university course too. And I had never felt so grateful. I started the role a month later with untold amounts of motivation to succeed and prove my manager and my company that they made the right choice by taking a chance on me. I finished the scheme three and a half years later with a first class degree, a heap of experience and a team of PMs that relied on me for day-to-day -day support and no debt. So I'd always assumed that I would stay in a support role throughout my career. I couldn't relate to anyone in the front office or in senior roles and saw no representation of anyone like me. So I didn't think it was possible. I always felt like my background made me stand out. But I was lucky enough to work for an amazing team, the multi-asset in charities, PMs at Newton, who saw the potential in me even when I didn't see it in myself, and I worked hard not to let them down. So in September of 2022, their trust encouraged me to put up my hand for the Research Associate Program, an opportunity for juniors to train to learn the ropes of being an investor, the role I'm in now. And as my confidence grew, I was able to put my hand up again to be part of the Diversity Products Pathway Program, where I've been given the support and the opportunity to have a path one day to become a portfolio manager. So after nearly seven years now at Newton, I finally feel that my value and my potential is different, is no different to anybody else's, despite our different backgrounds. And I'm now supporting those on the vocational trainee program with advice on how they can take, uh, take the same route as mine, whose approach, who approach me with the ambition to make it to the front office because they see someone like them there, which is why, representat why rep representation is so important. So my message here to everyone today is please take a chance on those, those that sometimes lack opportunity, others have through no fault of their own. We might not have the same qualifications or experience or interview skills as someone who's been lucky enough 
to have families that can pay for the best schooling or private tutoring to get into the best universities or that work in the industry already. But we can and we will still work hard for you and bring a diverse perspective to your companies. Our determination is unmatched. Take a chance on us. You will be unlocking potential and changing lives. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, over to Harleen. It's an amazing story, Lisa. <laughs> really well told. Um, so I've been at HSBC Asset Management now for about seven months, and I joined on the apprenticeship scheme. So I came straight out of A-levels. This was at age 19, and if I look at the date right now, I realise that this time last year, I think I was actually sitting my last exam. Um, it's crazy, crazy how quickly time has flown. So for me, what I really want to share today is what a degree apprenticeship is, what an amazing opportunity it is for young students coming into banks, and how I found my experience so far as a DA. So a degree apprenticeship is an alternative route into finance. So a lot of people of my age, when they think, you know, what do I want to do after A-levels? Do I want to go down the university route? Do I want to go down the apprenticeship route? For me, I don't think I wanted to go down completely one or the other. So a degree apprenticeship was perfect because it, because it combined both of them together. Now, there are so many benefits of doing these schemes. So as Lisa mentioned, you come out, so for me, it's four and a half years with no student debt at all. And instead, you have four and a half years worth of experience at a top bank. It's, it, honestly, it is invaluable. Um, it, for me, it was just a no-brainer. I couldn't understand why no one would want to pursue this route if they know that they want to go into finance. And actually, that's probably something that, you know, maybe at my age or maybe at the age of 18, people don't know completely what they want to do. Do they want to go in, if, you know, if you study economics at university, do you want to go into the energy industry? Do you want to go into finance, um, accounting, consultancy? Whereas for me, I was so set on going into an investments role. And I think I, I'll actually explain my story now about, about why investments in particular. So if I think about a few years ago, if my dad tried explaining, or if anyone tried explaining to me, you know, what's a mortgage, what's an interest rate, what what, what any of these financial terms was, my brain just switched off. I really, I didn't want to hear it. I was not interested at all. And then during lockdown, I got very bored. I think a lot of us got very bored. And I picked up two books to read. So one of them was classic, classic finance books. So Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Um, and the other one was by the founder of Starbucks. So that was Howard Schultz. And it was about how Starbucks was founded. So how it, it started off as a small coffee shop in Seattle to now being the huge multinational business that it is today. These books were really inspirational to me. Um, and it, kind, it got me thinking about finance and why financial literacy is so important to understand from a young age. And so I started I started looking into the property market and the stocks market, and it was the stocks market that really got me interested in finance. So I just, I found it so exciting, you know, you, the fact that these markets, they're not just moving every day, but every minute, um, every minute of the day, it's, it's incredible. And so I, I chose a stock that was, six six dollars and in i think in two or four months time well four months time it had gone up to 48 dollars, and i couldn't i couldn't believe it and the excitement of that for me of having to keep up with those market movements made me think to myself if i could do this as a hobby on the side of my career when i'm older that would be great i, I just i didn't realize that it actually it doesn't have to be a hobby it can be your career you can be working with markets every day if that's something that interests and excites you. So from then, my heart was set on getting into an investments role. And I heard about investment banking and investment banking wasn't something that I thought would be sustainable for me. 
Um, and also, I wasn't sure how you get into that at such a young age. And then, much like Lisa, we had someone come into our college and talk to us about their experience on an apprenticeship scheme. Um, and when I realized that, well, at 18, you can go into a job like this, that that was it. That was, from, from then on, I did everything I could to make sure that I got onto a degree apprenticeship scheme. So I applied to pretty much all the names around, around here, around Canary Wharf, um, and any of the top banks, because a lot of, you'll be surprised, but the big, the big four consultancies and almost all the top banks offer these degree apprenticeship programs. It's just about seeking them and finding out um, how to actually apply to them. There wasn't very much um, support at my college because they didn't really know what a degree apprenticeship was. Um, and it, in a way, I think that was almost a good thing because for these programs, what really has to come through in the interview process is not being rehearsed and polished. It's actually just being yourself. And that is how you stand out. It is your personality that really shines through. So if someone doesn't rehearse you, it can actually be a lot better to, I think you get further in an interview process. Um, so that was a very long-winded story of explaining why I decided that I wanted to get, get into an investments role. Um, I think the second thing that I really want to talk about is the importance of diversity in an investments role, because that is what today is about. It's about diversity and social mobility. So if I think about what I add to my team or what I add to the investments role, um, uh, investments industry, it, for me, I think it's youth. I came in at 18 years old into, in a front office position. Um, and, you know, it's not something, it is daunting. It's daunting and overwhelming because you have no experience behind you at all. And if you think about a graduate, they have done a degree that, you know, they've been studying finance for three years, whereas I, I hadn't, um, of course. Um, and I think that my age, can actually add a lot of value and bringing in that that youth element to to a team that is typically older. I think the oldest member on my team is probably about, sorry, the youngest member was probably about 20, 28. Um, for me, that's really old because I'm not in my 20s yet. So I think 20 is really old. Um, but uh, okay, if we think about investments, investments, what it entails is providing fund solutions to clients across the globe, um, representing HSBC as a house. So that's what I do. Now, to unpick a few things there. So if you're providing fund solutions, the it's a really competitive industry, asset management, and you have your fund has to stand out. So the only way for it to stand out is by having a diverse team behind you who are able to bring innovation and these new ideas. And I think that's that's what a young person can bring. And then to combine our ideas with people who have really senior members who have that ability to actually bring your ideas on board, that is essentially what can really set you, set you apart as, as an asset manager. Um, we also want our team to be representative of the diverse solutions that we offer. So if we're a global bank, um, and our clients are of all different ages, races, back, um, backgrounds, or the firms that they're at, they're all diverse in themselves, then you want to be represent, representing those, um, you want to be representative of that. So that's why I think it's, it's good to have a diverse team. Um, it's also an environment that's constantly changing. So working with markets, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's, it's a constantly evolving world. Um, and it's every every hour, every minute of the day. So keeping up with that change, you know, it's something where you actually do need you to come in and help to to, to create that that change. So to, to wrap this up, because I've gone on a lot about about that, I think that my three main things that I I want the room to really think about leave when you leave today is what is it that a young person can bring to the firm. Yes, we have no, we have no previous experience, but use that as an advantage to actually, we are a blank canvas, build us up and in terms of our knowledge and our experience and help to create that positive environment um, where we can actually share our views. Um, 
I think I'll leave it at that instead of three, actually. I think I, think I, like, I like that one. Um, yeah, so also what Lisa said, take a chance on us. I think we can add a lot of value to a team. But not I think, I know we can. We can. Thank you, Harleen. That's Amazing and a very valued member of our team. Um, moving on to Raheem. Thank you very much. I'm sort of reconsidering my student loans now, but here we are. Um, so my name is Raheem. I'm an analyst at Reddington. I'm an Upreach alumni, and I'm also in my final year of university at Durham. And if you'll indulge me for the next few minutes, I'll sort of tell you my life story. So I grew up in Bradford. That's where my grandparents immigrated to in the 60s. It wasn't the best of areas. You know, there's a lot of violent crime. More than my primary school went to prison than university. And secondary school was meant to be better. Um, two years in, the head teacher was arrested for fraud, a teacher was stabbed, and it was rated requires improvement. So that's the context I was working with. I never really met people who worked in professional services. You know, my only exposure to that was through TV, right? And even then, no one really looked like me or talked like me. And but here I am, a 16 year old kid, and I'm watching Suits, and I'm like, you know what, I want to be Harvey Specter. That's what I want to do in my life. So I did a, work week, a week's work experience at law firm, and I hated it. I was like, this is, this is terrible, this is boring. Um, but whilst I was there, I did some work on a spreadsheet, like, this is really cool. Went home, Googled jobs that use spreadsheets, and another week's work experience at an accountancy firm. And, you know, that wasn't bad, but it wasn't, wasn't right, you know, something felt a bit wrong. And I knew I wanted to be in financial services, but I didn't really know what that meant apart from accounting and investment banking, and I wasn't really sure what investment banking was. Um, so I'm, you see, I've, I've got this slight idea, but here we are. And at this stage, it was that sixth form, and someone had organized a Bank of America Insight Day. Went along to this, and there's a guy there who looks a bit like me, talks a bit like me, and he's telling this story about this charity called Upreach that sort of helped him get there. So go away, apply to this charity, get on, and spend the next year telling me what all these different things in the investment industry are and how they fit together and how someday I might play a role in that, right? And a big part of the Upreach program is professional mentoring. So in my first year, I got paired up with a great guy called Colin Wilkins at BlackRock, who is from world class background and sort of taught me loads about what actually happens in the city and let me sort of dare to believe that I might, I might belong here someday. And at the end of your first year at Upreach, you get, you get put on a spring week, and I did mine art at LCP. I had a bit of a, a better idea of what I wanted to do at this point. And so I went to LCP, and it was my first taste of investment consulting, and I thought, this is great, I loved it. Uh, I went home that week, I was like, you know what, I want to grow up, and I want to be a DB pensions consultant, this is great. Um, so I went home, and fed all this back to Upreach, and they paired me up the next year with a guy called Peter Vinkovic, who is the CIO at Reddington and never really heard of Reddington, didn't know what they did, sort of worked out they were quite similar to LCP, and that Pete's team worked with non-pension clients. So I went into this call, and it's a bit scary, right? It's a big guy, he's got CIO in his title, I don't really know what that means, but it's, it's scary. Um, I mean, we hit it off straight away, he asked me, you know, to tell me about you, and I start off, you know, I'm at Durham, I'm doing economics, he's like, no, no, he's me right there. Like, Not that, tell me about you like, as a person, tell me about your family, tell me about your story, tell me everything. And I did, and you know, it turned out his grandparents immigrated here from Poland, and I think that was a big step for me to realise, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not so different after all. And sort of a few months into this, I mentioned, you know, I'm looking for a placement. Yeah, do you know anywhere that's that's that does these kind of things? Said, you know, well, we've done a few before. We can set up a few interviews and and take it from there. So I had seven interviews. I met everyone on the team, and I got an offer to start to start in in August and. I won't labour too much about my actual time there. I mean, if I can tell you stories afterwards for those of you in the room, but the key pit that's, that's not that to me is a few weeks after I joined, I met, met David, uh, David Kanote Ohulu, who's co-founder of Reddington, set up sort of the 10,000 Interns Initiative, and he's a black man. And for me, seeing someone from an ethnic minority in a leading city role was remarkable, right? And I didn't know that was a thing that actually happened, so... I think that was the last, well, it was the last stepping point, thinking, you know what, I can, I can belong here. I know you're all sat there thinking, great, great story, sure, but so what, right? 
hopefully it's hopefully it's been clear how important it was to me to see people who had similar backgrounds to me or people that I could find some way of relating to, you know, Colin from a working class background showing me that working class people can make it in the city. Pete who's the grandson of an immigrant showing me that the grandchildren of immigrants can make it in the city and, and Darwin showing me that people from ethnic minority backgrounds can not only make it in the city but make it to the top of the city. Right? And I think I think the key for sort of my call to you guys is that, that that's the key, right? You can give you can do this for so many more people across the country by giving them a window into your world. So start with these low commitment insight days like I had at Bank of America and then build up spring weeks and internships that helps people staircase into into full time jobs. And if you take one thing from sort of anything I've said today, it's be a mentor. I mean I owe so much to these people who, you know, gave up gave up so much of their time. And one of the stories I have from when I was when I was mentored with Pete was a few weeks before I joined, I realised I don't know what people wear to the office. Right? I mean I know people wear like shirts and ties, but like, you know, what if I show up wearing some like tight shirt from next and it's like everyone's laughing at me. Um, so when I catch up with Pete, we sat down and he shared his screen and he was like, right, this is where we buy shirts from, you know, this is this is what you call it. They have these deals on, so they won't be too expensive. And that was that was massive for me, right? Because I had no one else that I could ask these questions to. Um, so yeah, to those people who took time out of their schedules to take those silly questions like, where do I buy a shirt from? It's a lot more powerful than you imagine. So yeah, that's, that's that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. I think um, you'll all agree with me such inspirational stories. And I, I think in order to close this, I'd like to share just a very brief example. So we, we do a lot of mentorship at HSBC. Um, and part of my external mentorships, I mentored someone, a 16 to 18 year old, um, over a number of years, um, very intelligent girl, but really lacking the self-belief and confidence. So over years we worked um, through this, she ended up at university, got a very good degree, carried on the mentorship. Um, she's now uh, an emerging market debts trader. And I received a, a phone call from her parents, obviously quite alarmingly for me thinking, oh my God, have I done something wrong? Um, and they were in tears on the phone saying, really, you have broken the cycle for generations within my family. And that really resonated with me personally. And I think a lot of the work that we do at HSBC is reflective of that mentorship, that support, really making sure that everybody that joins the organisation feels included and that we provide a very safe environment for people's development and growth. Um, so finishing off with some calls of action that we've heard today, give everybody a chance, give youth a chance, they are a blank canvas and we can hear, really help uh, provide that social capital to them um, and, and give people a window into your world. <laughs>